Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host Agassino Zynga. And this is episode number 504 of the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host Agassino Zynga. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Wherever this may podcast may meet you. Good. Amazing. Hope you're good wherever it may be. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast, have a five-star review and a share will help the show to go a long way. All right? A long, long way. And of course, support via Patreon is also more than welcome at patreon.com. Fortress Agostino, you get access to all my bonus content only available for my Patreon subscribers. So don't delay, get involved on it today. At patreon.com, Fortress Agostino, you can find a link in the description of wherever you're watching this on the stream or you're, watch, or you're listening to this via the podcast app. Click the link, join the Patreon, get involved. New content going on there every single week. So get involved. One pound only, equivalent of one dollar. Peanuts for most of you guys out there who are basking in the dollars. So get involved, don't delay, get involved, don't delay. So how's it going? How's it feeling? You feeling good? Feeling fine? Yeah, good. Hope you are. I had a little fun session the other day. I did like a little two and a half hour stream, maybe more, um, following the beef between um, Ariel Hawani and Brendan Shaw. So if you guys were around for that, big up. That was pretty fun. Um, there's going to be a response thing happening later. Oh, no, I think they put out a fire in the kid later. So I'm going to probably do a little response and, you know, follow that later on and hear what he had to say. But I'm sure it's not going to be anything worthwhile. But, you know, we'll give it a go anyway, regardless. So that was quite fun. And um, what I've been doing, of course, went to the gym today. A bit late today to go to the gym, but I still went anyway. Quite interesting that it was absolutely ram jammo full of kids. Like kids under 18, I think. Really awkward looking and really strangly looking, but incredibly strong. There's this one Asian dude, kid specifically, he was lifting like, I don't know, deadlifting easily. Like, I don't know, 200 plus pounds, like double his body weight. And it was great to see, to be fair. Don't get me wrong, he had straps, he lifts with a belt on so there's a lot of kind of enhancements to make him get that lift in but his form was great like the kid was strong as f like you know what I, mean? I was like very very impressed to see that and just impressed just to see in general loads like, again wrong it was annoying because you could hardly get on anything but as long as you asked them they were pretty fine with kind of moving around it was a bit out of order there was a couple of other dudes that came in who were kind of it felt like bullying the kids to get off the machines and shit but you know it is what it is i think when you're that age you kind of have to take those lumps and bumps and then when you get to be that age later in life you do it to somebody else yeah, i mean it's just a cyclical thing but it's good it kind of it kind of toughens you up trains you a little bit but it was just good to see that many kids in the gym in the first place like wow man it's encouraged i think a few of them were kind of sports team kids like kids that do cricket and whatever because nowadays i'd imagine most sports doesn't matter what you play there's a strength and conditioning element to it right people want to push themselves or get themselves to the best um put themselves in peak physical condition so that they can perform athletically in whatever field or domain you know of, of artistic of athletic expression that they're basically um involved in so i'm not surprised some of these kids are hitting the gym super hard so it was really cool to see that um all these under 18 kids going and attacking things so that was fairly fine my session went pretty great did overhead press deadlifts and back squats mostly i think i maxed out on all the weights about what was it 2020 the bar is 35 i think i did like 180 is it 180 how much is it how much is a barbell weigh um how much does barbell weigh i'm gonna put it in labs all right i'm gonna look at my phone because my computer can be a little bit finicky let's see what it says here how much does a barbell weigh uses 45 pounds really okay i didn't know that so it's 45 so what i do so i did um 220s plus a 15 so plus that what plus 45 so i did about 80 pounds today right is that what i did 80 pounds okay 80 pounds all right is that what i did hold on i did two 15s which is 30 and 40 Oops, sorry 30 plus 40 plus 45 is 115 so I did 115 pounds today on back squat deadlifts and um no overhead press of course i didn't do that overhead press i did a 15 in it what's a 15 um what's a 30 sorry so it's, i did on the overhead press i did 30 no, I said, sorry, the, the barbell's 45. It's 45 plus 30 for the two plates, 75 pounds. So I did 75 pounds on the overhead press and then 115 on the back squat deadlifts. And I'm feeling good, man. I'm feeling sprightly. Then I ended it with a little wad, a little cardio wad. So I did like um five 200 meter kind of, you know, sprints on the rowing machine. Then I did five press ups. 
then I did 10, no, 15 um, kettlebell swings, 16 ke kilogram kettlebell, and then went over and ended it with um, knee raises on like the pull-up bar, five of those, and then come back on the row machine and again, just rinse, repeat for five sets, and I did it on about 12 minutes or so, trying to get down under 10. I think usually CrossFit people like to have their time, especially if you're doing it as quick as you can in the gym by yourself you should be having it within like the seven to ten minute kind of range obviously if you're math rage and those kind of freaks you'll probably do that in three four minutes but people like myself you probably have to aim around the seven seven to ten minute mark um to kind of get those workouts in but yeah feeling good feeling fresh got myself a little iced coffee and whatever so you know many things to talk about today so grab yourself a little drink as well if you've got one and let's just dive on deep in it let's just dive on deep First thing first happened today, we have some very interesting news regarding Newcastle United, a football club here in England, or in the Premier League specifically, who have now been taken over by a Saudi-led consortium, ending Mike Ashley's 14-year reign of terror, right? Mike Ashley's the... Uh, what well, was the former owner of Newcastle, most famous for the Sports Direct chain here in the UK, which is quite possibly one of the worst retail experiences you've ever experienced. You know those shops wherever you live in the world where... The, the customers hate going to shop there the staff hate working there um and it's just a shit show right in general and the stock and the stock is just random right nothing makes sense you can't find anything whatever's on the floor is on the floor whatever's on the shop floor so it's on the shop floor there's no point asking anyone for, to find anything in the back because they're not going to find anything for you my one kind of memorable moment when i realized that people hated working in sp sports directors when i went to a sports direct here in london i was really looking for something you know sometimes you get even though you know what you're going to expect in the shop, you still kind of go with kind of high expectations or hope. No, you're hope. You, go in, you go in with hope. You're hoping today will be some something different. I remember walking in, looking for something, trying to find an assistant to help me because I couldn't find the thing myself. So I spent like, you know, let's say 20 minutes walking around, obviously, in those kind of places. When you come in with your jacket from outdoors, the temperature changes, it's really warm. You start getting hot, you start getting flustered, you start getting agitated. I know I do anyway when I go to shopping malls or I go to shops in general. I hate being in them too much, which is ironic considering I spent the early part of my career mostly working retail, especially in fashion stores and whatnot. But I just can't be in those places for too long. So I get flustered, I get angry. And I started looking for someone. I couldn't find anyone. And it was weird because... As I walked into the store and I did my little half an hour rummage to try and find the thing that I wanted myself, in that half an hour, I didn't see one sales assistant, not one store employee, not one manager. All I saw were the guys and girls that were on the tills, you know, scanning things up. And bless the guys on the tills too, because they make you, when you're, of course, tills are usually the best jobs people want, right? Even that or the change rooms when you're working in retail. Change rooms are easy to kind of manage. You kind of have to maybe replan your little sh your little rack that you have, make that, you know, keep that clean, make sure the change rooms are in good order, make sure people are not doing anything untoward in there. And that's it. You're basically fine. And obviously the tills, but the tills, because I know everyone wants to work on them, they'll make you sometimes upsell people. So they'll put socks there, magazines and shit. And they'll have a camera, obviously, directly pointing at the till. So if you don't offer people stuff, there's always the threat that the manager's looking at you in their office and is going to say something, which they never do. There's no sound on these cameras anyway, so it's a bit useless. So it's just a weird way they kind of try and keep you in line, right? But with these kind of weird threats and that don't really, they can't really action in any kind of meaningful way. So here I am, we're looking for sources. I can't find one. I get flustered, I get annoyed. Then I spot where they... No, and then I go to somebody, I find a manager or somebody, I forgot who it is, and then they stay over the, over the tannoy, can, they, 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 yeah, they come out just as I'm about to try and look for somebody, even though I would have missed them, because sports are usually quite massive, or they're packed and you can't see people from across the aisles. I find the person, I'm like, hey, I need some help, and they're like, yeah, no worries. They go on a little walkie-talkie, and they say, yeah, hey, everybody, whoever the store assistant, you know, whatever sells it, doesn't come out on the shop floor, sells it, come out on the shop floor, whatever he repeats. And legitimately, you would have felt it was like cockroaches. The moment the guy walked away, everyone kind of like jumped out of the change room, out of the store, out of the stock room, and kind of like tried to pretend like they weren't in there and they were mucking around with stuff. You know, it's the stuff I've done before myself. And it was just like, wow, I realized at that point, people hate working in this place, man. It must be one of the worst jobs in the world that they're willing to stay in the back. Because usually if you're at retail, you know that staying in the back doesn't really waste time. What waste time is it being busy, right? You running up and down, getting shoes, being active, talking to your friends on the show floor, busting, maybe flirting with a couple of girls and shit. That's actually what winds the time away during the day. But hanging around in the, in the stock room or whatever doesn't really do much. So if people are willing to stay there, it means it's that bad on a shop floor that they're willing to do anything then stay there, anything. So... Newcastle fans should be happy. Mike Ashley's no longer there. This is news coach of Sky Sports News. Of course, I, myself being a fan of Man United, I'm worried and scared because this obviously shows that 
you know, there's going to be plenty of clubs in the Premier League now who are going to be run by actual people who want to win things, regardless of whatever you think, how they made their money is ethical, moral or whatnot, is another story. But there's going to be owners who are in it for sporting achievement, sporting glory. Um, and obviously that's going to lead to more money because I think that's the easy math that people can see. The more often that you're on TV playing these big clutch games, these big high stake matches and you're in these big high stake tournaments and you're competing for the biggest titles, the biggest trophies in, the, in your domestic league, wherever you may, in your domestic country. You're obviously having some memorable moments in these tournaments too. The more money you're going to generate one way or the other because things are going to be shared. People are going to be in tune with what you're doing. It's just going to be a whole different vibe around the club overall. And if you know anything about Newcastle, you know that those guys up there are football mad, right? They've got probably one of the best fan bases in England, hands down. They're probably one of the they're probably one of the only clubs in the UK who can say they're legitimately sleeping giants, right? They just need good owners to come in and kind of give them the cash injection that they need in order to kind of bolster what they're doing. They've got a good catchment area to kind of scout youth team players too. They're really set up to win in that regard. So clubs like myself, clubs like United, who are kind of dwindling, especially with the Glazers in charge, clubs like Arsenal, clubs like Tottenham, they should be worried, very, very worried. So it says the following, the 300 million takeover of Newcastle has officially been completed with a Saudi-led consortium ending Mike Ashley's 14-year ownership of the club. The Premier League has confirmed the takeover in a statement on Thursday saying it had received a legally binding assurances, assurances sorry, that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will not control the United Kingdom. <laughs> is that it? Okay. That's all you need, legally binding assurances. The investment group is led by a public investment fund, which I'm sure is owned by the Saudi people, but hey, we'll talk about that another day. Also comprises of PCP Capital Partners and RB Sports and Media. Newcastle's new owners are expected to replace Steve Bruce as head coach but no decision yet has been made of when this happened so it's just happened yesterday they're already changing coaches this is why people were saying that the lack of football shock to United is what's affecting us the most that's what's basically keeping Oji going so shock in a job because our owners at the moment seem like from what we've seen the evidence so far has proven over the time that the only, the only, the only occasion a manager can get sacked at United is if they don't finish the top four and Oli's shown quite clearly he's competent enough to get this team to finish in the top four because there's a lot of talented players there. And usually whenever he's backed against the wall, he always delivers and he always pulls out a result out of the hat, right? So cool. But people would always say that if we had a structure in place, if we had demanding owners, this would be the pressure you'd be under. It would be like straight away takeover, straight away the pressures on the manager. Are you winning anything? If not, you get replaced with somebody else because the club needs to be winning things in order to justify the level of investment they're putting in. Because it's not a plaything, do you know what I mean? They still want to make some money for it, right? The consortium does not want to make any new decisions, but it's understood to be one of priorities of deciding who will take over the dugout ascension part moving forward. Newcastle's next match is live on Sky Sports on October 17th. Supposedly, there's a story that they're going to either go for a really experienced manager in you know, Antonio Conte, former manager of Chelsea, obviously the guy that won the Serie A um, title with Inter Milan last season before he left. So if you go for someone like him, who's basically another version of Jose Mourinho, someone's going to come in, he's going to demand top players, he's going to demand top results, he's going to demand trophies straight away. And then you kind of run that down to where it needs to go, get your trophies, get your limelight, get your memorable moments, and then hand it over to a younger coach who can maybe develop some players, maybe bring in some youth team members, blah, 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 or do the opposite and then hire you know the youth team first the youth team coach first let him lay the foundations and then hand it over to the contest to kind of finish the job we see what happened it continues to say newcastle united deserves to be a top club we want to get there it'll take time but this is where we will get there says stavley um the chief executive of the pcp partners capital who is now the director of newcastle united board right so this woman here is director of newcastle's board um hopefully people out there give her the props that she deserves as well for being a high level operator but she looks fucking scary in it as, as you should right this is what it should be if you're a type a person in any kind of industry especially industry like this working with people from the middle east and doing big money deals you're not going to look like rihanna are you right you're going to have a bit of steel about you. you're going to be a little bit toughened around the edges isn't it because you have to compete with all these fucking sharks in the room people who could legitimately get you killed in it r.i.p and jamal Khashoggi. <laughs> We're proud to be part of the Premier League. It's an incredible competitive league. We just love it. Premier League football is the best in the world and Newcastle is the best team in the world. Wow, already. We want to see this um we want to see it get these trophies, obviously, at the top of the Premier League and in Europe. But to get these trophies means patience, investment, time. We want everybody to work with us to build the club towards what it needs to be. Stavley also discussed Bruce's future in recruitment in an interview with Scarsbus News. The new names are Newcastle. Amanda Stavley joined at Newcastle by Yassir Al Rumai. Rumian, 
Rumayan, right? Rumayan, the governor of, P, of PFP, of PIF, who will serve as a non-executive chairman. Jamie Rubin, who will also be a director of the uh, director of the club, representing our P Sports Media. Um, Al Rumayan said, "We are extremely proud to become new owners of Newcastle United, one of the most famous clubs in English football." Um, look at these two boys, two lads at the back. Also, a lad and a girl. I don't know, but they seem really happy. Yeah, she's a bit boss eyed, isn't it, Stavely? Bless her. But, you know, she's doing the damn thing. We thank the Newcastle fans for the tremendously low support over the years and we're excited to work to them together. Stavely added this is a long term investment. We're excited about the future of prospects of Newcastle United. We intend to install the United philosophy across the club, establish clear purpose, and help provide leadership that will allow Newcastle to go on to achieve bigger teams over the long term. Our ambition is aligned with the fans to create a consist consistently successful team that's regularly competing in major trophies and generates pride across the globe. That is what should be this warning signal to all clubs, Man United included. They are trying to make this club into the next man city they want to win the title they want to win win you know um, domestic trophies they want to challenge in europe like that's what they want they're not in it for the play play they're not in it just to kind of you know flip some money maybe be able to bring in some youngsters sell them for a profit no 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 no. we want to create a dynasty right a, a winning club that just wins um on a continual basis and i, I don't know with the, the owners that we have the owners that arsenal have at the moment um, you know, the stuff that's happening with FSG and Liverpool to a certain extent, you should be worried. Um, Ruben said, we look forward to a great future with Newcastle, Newcastle is a fantastic city, which is why our family has been investing heavily in this area for many years. To become part of the club and it's amazing fans of privilege, we will build a true com community club based upon our family's knowledge of the city in line with the plan to have been worked with closely with Newcastle City Council to deliver a long-term sustainable growth for the area. So the area is going to get a, a jolt. Everyone's going to get a jolt, man, for Newcastle being invested. And again, like I said, it couldn't happen to a better club. They've got some of the best fans in the country. They've been putting the pressure on Mike Ashley for the past 10 years, it feels like in terms of getting him out of the club he's finally decided to sell or he's finally got an offer that he thinks is acceptable and now he's going to ride off into the sunset on his yacht you know probably do coke off some models bums and shit and the fans are going to be able to get their club back and have the ability to maybe see them win a title win some domestic trophies maybe even challenge in europe it's going to be amazing for them so congratulations to everybody associated with newcastle i'm sure you guys will enjoy the time that you have and people like myself are going to be just um, hope, hopeless. And look at this, look at this headline from Sky Sports. Amanda Stavely says Newcastle's long term ambition is to win the Premier League after takeover. Like, oh, mate, it's long for us. It's long for everybody in the, in the Premier League right now, man. But hey, what can you do? We just have to kind of get over it, I guess, isn't it? And not even get over it, we just have to kind of bide our time and wait. And we can't do nothing. The Glaciers don't look like they want to sell. The time the when there was a rumor they might sell, I think they priced out the buyer. I think it was something like four billion or something was the asking price to buy United and to get the Glazers out. I'm hopeful if it does happen anyway and we do get new owners. I just want them to make sure that they don't ever they kind of push away the class of 92 as far away from the club as possible. I don't want any of those guys involved. All those guys that have been apologists for, for flipping Ole Gunnar Soul Sharks, the ones who have been telling us to sign Harry Kane, he'll be the answer to everything. The ones that keep telling us we need more players just to win stuff and you're not looking at the coaching and not looking at the tactics and formations. All those guys who have been kind of, you know, um, basically speaking out both sides of their mouths i don't want them anywhere near the club if we get to taken over by somebody i want them far 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 away see your spectators get actual professionals that know what they're doing people who know the game who can come in with a clear idea of what they want to do and give them the keys to the city that's what i say but hey what do i know this is courtesy of mix mag pretty good news here for myself and people in london who like to party hard and go out at night and shit it says here, Sadiq Khan hints at the night tube could reopen in the next few weeks. If you don't know, the UK has a night tube or night lines. There's a few of them. I think it's like four. I'm not too sure. I know I know which one I use. And usually it kind of runs a little bit more of a staggered, you know, kind of running time, maybe half an hour, 20 minutes. I forgot what the time is. But essentially it provides you with an option to get home or to get to kind of main stations where you can maybe walk home or get a bus home instead of having to get the night buses all the way home, which are you know diabolical usually after midnight because they're full of wrong ones or they just take really long so you can always get a train back at certain times which is obviously really really beneficial and says the following so he kind of hint has himself sorry so he kind of hinted at the night tube could be oh no, of course it was um temporarily suspended sorry because of covid that's why i just wanted to let you know about that and um, because i actually we we actually found that out when we were on our way back from a night out 
tried to go to the station, we realised, oh no, it's been, it's been kind of poor since COVID or since the pandemic has started, which makes complete sense. It says, Sadiq Khan has hinted that the night tube could be back in service in the next few weeks after fans signed a petition to have it reopened. One else on LBC morning about when Londoners could see it, he says, I'm hoping to make an announcement in a couple of weeks. We've been trying to get it back. TFL have been working incredibly hard to bring it back. The Mayor of London has also been under mounting pressure after a petition to restate the nighttime service London garnered 75,000 signatures as women look for safe ways to get home following the murders of Nasib. Sabina Nisa and Sarah Everett. I don't think Sarah Everett and Sabina Nisa things had anything to do with not being able to get a night tube home, to be completely honest. But I understand the sentiment. Campaigners have had have said that the continued closure of the night tube is unsafe for women in London. It's unsafe for everybody, not just women. Like I understand women obviously would be far more unsafe because they're small and they're dainty and there's no way to defend yourself against a, a dude no matter what size he is, especially at night when there's no one around and shit. But you know. After 12 at night, especially in the UK or in London specifically, depending on where you are, it does turn into a bit of a zombie film. Like, it's just, it just gets wild. And anyone that's been to Dawson, Shoreditch, after even 11 p.m., you know how flipping insane people get. It says, um, the right for outcry at the recent murders of Sabina Nisa and Sarah Avred have London um, streets epitomizes the fear women face walking alone or standing on the streets. Um, said Ella Watson, who started an online petition, told the I in the UK and London women and girls are unsafe in the streets, especially at night. The night tube has been closed since the beginning of the pandemic of TFL bosses revealing earlier this year that there were no plans to open it until 2022. It'd be hilarious if somehow they managed to open the night tube and say, only women are allowed in it for a certain amount of hours, like two hours, women only, and then the next are mixed. That would be hilarious to do something like that. I wouldn't put it past this government, especially Sadiq Khan. He's always looking to appease people with stupid political gestures like that. At the end of the day, this is safe for everybody. Everyone needs a night tube. Everyone needs to understand women probably need it more in the idea of, like, you know, who's more at risk of getting molested and jumped and whatnot. Fair enough, but let's just be, let's just, you know, let's just be sensible for a change. Sadiq Khan told the BBC, he was aware the night tube was a vital way to people to travel at night safely, but also a lifeline to London nightclubs and venues. Very true. They understand the importance of night tube, but not simply for women's safety. A really important issue is traditionally for the nighttime economy. That's very true. I didn't actually think about that. Like a lot of people have probably been put off from going. Like for the other day I went to Fabric, right? Or the other day, a few weeks ago I went to Fabric. And the reason why I went there is because where I live is fairly near a bus that you can take that takes you directly there kind of you just have to get like a little five minute walk and you get to the actual club and so because of that i was able to get there in like what 30 40 minutes which is probably just 10 minutes over to get an uber so it's not even that far do you know what i mean and you get the opportunity to like see you know things or whatever it's much cheaper than getting an uber you just listen to your music hang about whatnot but i understand that journey might not be the safest for a girl to go to because especially if you have to get two bus stops and two or two buses and the other bus stop is like in some secluded area i definitely understand it but for the clubs and stuff imagine not be having people getting on the night tube it was a kind of lifesaver especially if you're going places like fabric no, especially going places like yeah fabric and fold are good examples because they open so late but sometimes you don't want to stay until the end sometimes you want to go home at free and unfortunately because how the buses are set up and the night tube is sometimes if you leave at free you might end, actually end up getting back home at six so there's no point you might just stay at six anyway and just get the night tube or get the early morning tube whenever that starts usually it starts about 5 a.m onwards so i definitely get the the kind of hesitancy around people not going out without the tube um and then to end it, it says well lit night tube a support from staff and the british transport police gives women a safe rapid route home from events the reopening a night tube will create a demand improve safety and in turn support the recovery of the nighttime economy so yeah looking forward to that when that finally does happen but the return of the night tube is happening real soon real soon real bloody soon mm -mm. next we have this. You've just been all over the internet. Courtesy of Vogue. Um, Adele's on the cover of Vogue because she's due to have a big comeback. And um, again, maybe it's just, um, I don't know, unless the man nearly um, Mac McLillan took the pictures. That makes complete sense. But anyway, maybe it's just me being a little bit um, unaware and stuff and not really paying attention to stuff like this. And I think, you know, Adele seems to be like the, the Jay-Z for women, right? People just seem to love her unrequently without really trying to explain why exactly they love her. Perhaps they find her music incredibly boring, um, the kind of music you want to kind of maybe jump off a roof of a building from to listen to all the time. I don't really see any difference between the music she makes and someone like a Bon Iver or something, right? But I know it resonates with some people. And again, maybe it's because 
it's weird to say out loud because people will get offended by the stuff like this but I get the feeling that maybe it was because you know she was relatable because she was a fat girl and she was really pretty and everyone kind of saw themselves in her a little bit and the fact that she had this amazing voice you know somebody really awkward and maybe you're shy I don't know whatever she had a bombastic personality when she got on stage I don't know whatever it is it's, it's woman's business not my business at all it's just interesting to see though how big of a star that she is that she's getting a rollout that I've probably never seen this is like equivalent to like a Taylor Swift rollout right small reveals her going to parties um you know the divorce thing happening this breakup the guy getting alimony or the guy get the guy getting paid alimony whatever it may be he's getting like a, a couple of hundred grand per month off of her because obviously she's incredibly incredibly wealthy she then reveals her new boyfriend this black dude i forgot i think he's part of rock nation I'm not really too sure then she does all these pictures of her going to parties and stuff and hanging out she still kept the weight off she was incredible she's not as you know gone as it was before because most of what happens when you when you're really big i've been there before um i was like my biggest was like 280 and i got down to about 180 when you're really really big and you go down really, really uh, by a huge amount you kind of end up looking a bit weird a little bit like a scarecrow your head doesn't fit your body sort of, sort of thing but then as you kind of start to get used to your body you start to kind of maybe you know figure out what weight kind of works best for you because like i said i think the best way to do it is just to kind of get as low as you can and then sort of work your way up to weight that makes sense like mine was like one if, if i was if i got down to lowest 186 my comfortable weight was about 200 220 right around that sort of mark give myself a little buffer and i guess same this happened to adele she looks great fantastic but there was a massive rollout about all that stuff you can see all these little pictures you know of her not really much communication through her directly but just loads of stuff of her being around and active and you could feel there's something happening in the in you know something there was something in the air something was definitely happening then all these projections popped up all over the country all over the world of the country all over the world of the country she's adele um with the number 30 showing that you know this was an album coming in the way and and now obviously it's been announced that she is releasing an album and i don't know man I think obviously she's a beast she's a you know um there's a lot of money behind it a lot of people um riding for her and obviously like her for what she does and stuff but I don't know it just feels like the the attention doesn't match what I'm hearing do you know what I mean the music isn't that interesting I don't know maybe it's just me I just find it so like you know like it's cool but yeah big up her still regardless um she looks fantastic that, that, that that's probably the main thing you need to say about this um she was looking great uh, you know uh face snatched as hell great makeup here on the cover everything just looks fantastic on her and again it's just another illustration of just a kind of an unfair not an unfair but a kind of realistic interest that most people know that if you were to lose i don't know how much you lost 60 pounds or whatever on most people you would look incredible that's just the facts of the matter right if you can lose 60 pounds regardless of how big you are or maybe 20 let's say between 20 and 60 pounds you're gonna look fucking fantastic and unfortunately it's very difficult nowadays to do so you know no one's saying it's easy it's very difficult in most times to do so but i think nowadays especially people working from home and being sedentary it just encourages a lot of laziness and um you know people are just generally more they just generally i feel like people generally i don't not say don't care but people are a lot more relaxed about their appearance in that regard so there's not much of a social pressure in that way and of course no one's going to ever call you fat really because you know that would be a taboo and people will be you'd be chastised from your own friendship group so that pressure doesn't exist unless you're in certain type of friendship groups so you can kind of get away with being somewhat somewhat kind of lax with your physique and your fitness and all that sort of stuff right but you really and truly the key we need to take away from this is that she has always been a pretty and attractive woman anyway but she does look far better now than she ever did before and it's just a startling kind of reveal and transformation and again having been a bigger dude before and lost a lot of weight and then gained it and lost it again i know how difficult it is to keep it off so for her to keep it off as a woman especially is just a fantastic achievement and some point thing needs to be says something needs to be kind of stressed a lot more about it like she just looks amazing like she looks amazing like you know I mean she's still she's still able to keep the hips and the dumper she looks fucking great man let's not let's not play around she looks absolutely fantastic imagine what the live shows are going to look like visually with how she's looking now and the art direction that they're kind of going for but the rollout for flipping adele is just wild bruv like honestly look at this whole spread on flipping vogue mad pictures a whole interview and then i think there was a segment here where she said something about she was going to do something with Skepta or something and Tyler Craig and another rumor came out that oh no I'm not doing anything no collaborations the only way I'm listening to this album is if it has those guys on it if this album doesn't have those guys I don't think I can put myself through it but I probably will just to kind of hear what it's got to be said but I would like to hear her do something a little bit more you know I don't know just jazz it up a little bit so she says here this is quote says 
it's when British Vogue it says um she queues up another the next song is the one I is one I wrote when I went to the studio the day after Angela said I can't see you a certain combination of elements sexy 70s groove heavy strings heavier lyrics immediately calls to mind Marvin Gaye what's going on a very big reference on the album turns out oh okay interesting to see my little love Adele sings in a low smoky register I see your eyes widen like ocean when you look at me so full of emotion between um, verses our snippets of conversation she had with Angelo during the year of anxiety recorded at her therapist's suggestion the song ends with bits of raw teary voicemail she left for a friend she's also inspired to incorporate voice notes by Tyler Creator and British rapper Skepta oh interesting they were rumoured to be dating but I assumed that wasn't really true um, nothing really came of it maybe it was who knows um, I thought it might be a nice touch seeing as everyone's been at my door for the last 10 years as a fan to be like would you like to come in so okay that would be interesting so there's not going to be any collaborations but there'll be these little voice notes and you know clips and stuff from her time spent away from the public eye because she doesn't the good thing about her which is really interesting for a celebrity that big and she's clearly got a charming personality i think that's why people seem to like her she doesn't really do many interviews in it there's not much content i don't really know much about the woman again i don't know much about her music either but you don't really hear much about her she's not in the media doesn't do crazy instagram lives seems to kind of keep herself to herself so for sure there's gonna be a lot of material there for adele fans to really kind of dig their teeth in sink their teeth into they've been starved for a while so when it does come out it's going to be wall-to-wall coverage there might be a documentary it's probably going to be a tour because again it's no coincidence all the big stars the Bruno Mars and the freaking, um, what's his name? Bruno Mars and um, Anderson Pack album got pushed back. No surprise. They're both two, especially in Bruno Mars's case, absolute, you know, mega stars. They're not going to go on tour. They're not going to release an album during global pandemic where they can't go to most places. They're going to wait until it's safe to go outside again and they're going to announce the album, then do a massive tour. North America, maybe South America, parts of Europe, you know, Oceanic, they're going to go hard that way. So it's no surprise also that Adele, being as big as she is, would only start announcing and rolling out the album now because Adele can't put out an album and just have it stream and then do a release party on flipping Instagram Live. It's just not what somebody of that size of kind of celebrity and attention and following can do. It's just not going to happen. But I just want to know how much money they spent on the rollout. This rollout is nuts. There's going to there's going to be more to it. It's probably going to be one of those kind of um what are those TV programs called like those you know what's that dumb nut um James Corden. She's probably going to go on one of those shows. She might do a podcast, I'm assuming, right? There's going to be loads of media around Adele on this album coming forward, especially if it talks about the breakup, if it talks about her being 30. I don't know if she is 30, but the name, number, the number, the album's called 30. Um, growing up, starting a family, new relationship, all this sort of stuff is definitely going to be on there. So let's look. I'm looking forward to it just to kind of see what it's going to, just to hear what it's going to be like. But again, like I said, I think for me personally, it's weird to say this but i think she's like uh, seriously overrated but again i don't know maybe it's just not for me that's probably why i'm just not for it but hey we'll see when it drops we'll see when it drops so um let's see the next thing is here yeah, this is nice, isn't it? See, this is Amazon have opened their first UK general store. The company launched its first... Yes, it's coming to go in Amazon's continuous expansion to physical retail with the opening of the first general store in the UK. The shop which, which sells books, technology and toys has been re has opened in Blue Water Shopping Centre near Dartford and Kent. Round man. Blue Water used to be the lick back in the day. Now Westfield's taken over. White City or Stratford, but Blue Water used to be the vibe. That's where everyone will go. To go to the cinema on Saturdays, go put on your best tracksuit, put on some cologne, try and chat up to girls, obviously get absolutely nowhere, um, you know, fuck around, get chased. Like, it was just a sick place to be. So the company launched its first four-star store, which only sells um, products rated four stars or above by customers and trending items in the US in 2018. That's a funny kind of website to go to. It said the shop reflects um, what its customers are regularly buying and enjoying. Using data from online business to see which customers or items are popular. Adam jo Ad Andy Jones, director of the Four Star Store, says the excellent master of the Rito giant, which started plans of a store in the, after the pandemic. He said, I've been working on this for the past two years, so obviously just keen um, to get customers in and see what they think. Um, the pandemic um, didn't really change our thinking. We've seen that the model has worked really well in the malls in the US. Of course, the pandemic didn't change their thinking. Amazon cashed out during the pandemic. So, what they've got on sale here, let's see if I can see the picture zoom in. So they've got, I think, ebooks. It looks like, um, what else is on here? They've got Alexa bits and bobs. 
they've got Fitbits, they've got computer, okay, so stuff that is always selling well on there, wireless headphones, I see it, like console controllers, periphery devices, maybe like, you know, fires, no, look, chrome sticks and whatnot, what's it, Chromecast, whatever stuff and whatnot, right, I think they sell there, it looks like by the sounds of it, it's still kind of, mm, I don't know, it seems like a weird place to go for that sort of stuff in blue or in it, you want to go all that way to go pick up those kind of stuff, because th those things are like, I won't say they're knickknacks, but they're the thing that you kind of, you buy them out of necessity at a time that you need them. You don't go and seek them like in a shop that way, right? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, the store had displays with products from both small partners and Amazon, um, from all small partners, Amazon, uh, through its market operation. However, the retail boss would not confirm whether the more stars are already um, UK plans. Da, da, da. What else here it says it added that the assortment of products in the store will change on a regular basis and the firm's creators respond to a couple of feedback and new releases. That's a cool role in it to be a creator, a curator at Amazon. Funny, innit? They've taken a role that's very kind of um very serious, that's kind of a little bit um intellectual in terms of its kind of application, especially in the art world, and they stripped it of all of that and just kind of made it super functional, innit? curator because that's what you're doing you're curating your items in the store like all of the kind of dreamy kind of um uh you know vibe around it from when you're an artist completely goes anyway it continues amazon opened its first uk retail store last year the retailer said the model had been well received since opening and has grown the bricks and mortar grocery arm to six stores okay interesting let's see what well, go on when it does eventually open in it but it looks fucking wild Next on the list here, what else do we have? We've got this courtesy of Shade Bar. It's a bit of a non-story, really. I guess it's a conversation recorded secretly between, um, what's his name, Digger D and some of his friends, um, talking about the new rapper called Ardy, the little white kid there on the top corner, top left-hand corner. And I guess this is more payback for the Shade Borough because allegedly the story goes that Digger D was responsible for getting their page taken down because he didn't like something that they posted on their site about him linking some girl in some hotel. Allegedly, that's what effectively happened. I don't know how he took it down. Maybe he got his fans to kind of mass flag it. I don't know. Maybe he's got his ways. He's a kid. He maybe he's figured out he's got someone on the on his flipping payroll that can get people's shit, pages taken down. I don't know. There's a hack around it. Who cares? Who knows? Now the site's obviously come back or the pages come back itself and they've kind of wanted to... Um, get you know get Digger D back in blood and this is the way to do it by leaking this kind of um you know message exchange between him and some friends on IG DMs talking about this new rapper called RD I guess it's the time he might have blown up I'm not too sure let's hear what they have to say but it shouldn't be too bad I don't think why are they dissing him I'm not gonna lie that's actually the perfect guy to have on that team because cause he says in his bars um white boy racist Obviously, they're saying it's shit and that, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I hear what they're saying, but I just need... I need that moolah! I got like, all oh, these shit, man, but... It'll blow, innit? Because, like, the things... He says certain things and he's a TikTok guy. He blows on TikTok, so you get me? And brother, how are they gonna say the tune shit if they ain't even heard the tune? Oh, we know, he might go in. Yeah, it seems right in the mill. Just a couple of friends having the chat. Again, maybe it's because it's embarrassing because obviously you don't want your private conversation behind closed doors when you say things a little bit more candid amongst your friends about maybe people you work with, fellow rappers and whatnot, but I don't think it's that much of a big deal. I, I think Ardy seems like somebody who kind of knows what he is. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think they're even in the same sort of, I don't think they even share fan bases, right? Digger D and Ardy, I don't imagine they would. So it's not really that big of an issue, I don't think in that regard. But again, artists for whatever reason they're a bit jealous they're a bit paranoid um when a new kid kind of comes onto the block you remember when he came on and he they were making all the kind of um what you call it beef with the other kid i forgot his, his name the other white kid right that kind of looks they kind of look alike they immediately made that into a situation because they're both white and they both kind of make the similar type of music it's like nah they can coexist there's enough fans out there for both of these kind of guys and even if not it doesn't matter you know what i mean you're gonna disrupt disrupt somebody else's bag it's just not gonna work that way so hey embarrassing to say the least i guess with strike he comes out of this looking the best because he was quite honest about even though he doesn't know the guy doesn't probably fuck with him but yeah he's gonna work well on the tune i see why they put him on there it's commercial isn't it like let him rock but i guess diggity in that regard it happens sometimes isn't it when you're when when there's 
it's always difficult when you're in a friendship group and there's people who generally just don't give a fuck about the people that you kind of don't like and then you try to raise the you kind of trying to you try and kind of pro people into have a reaction for somebody that they clearly don't give a shit about and then you're trying your best to keep it going and they still don't care until they get to a point where they start defending them and then you start getting angry. Do you know what I mean? That can be really awkward in that regard. I think you don't want to be the guy saying that, no, you got to hate him too because I hate him, car. my man did, did, did. You don't want to be that guy. You just want to kind of leave it alone. But, you know, I don't think he's going to lose any sleep over it. I don't think it's that big of a deal, really. People are making a mountain out of a molehill out of this. I think if you're hard, you just kind of brush it off. You know, you probably say some mad stuff in your DMs or in your kind of group messages with your friends about other people too. I know if my group messages or my DMs or my text messages got leaked, you know it'd be pretty embarrassing the stuff that i've said about people especially people that i don't know because it's way more fun that way it's way more fun to talk shit about people you don't know right especially to your friends because you don't know who they fuck they are um it doesn't affect you either way right um but people seem to make such a big deal about those kind of things which is why social media in general isn't such is as fun as it was before people get their feelings hurt too much but say la vie um they're both fine they're both young they're both incredibly wealthy and you know have the attention of all the kids and all the ladies love them and shit they'll be fine man they're completely fine there's no issue off of the back of that i wouldn't imagine so anyway but stranger things have happened in it then we move on to some next uk pacific news mostly on a guy that i've covered on my channel a couple of times on here um Dachavelli looks like he's trying to resurrect his somewhat dying career or a career that seems like it's on life support or a career that seems to just pst, it's not even life support it's just he's probably got the worst of the worst outcome now right because it's one thing having a career where you are kind of stagnating like nothing's working you're trying to do sounds you're trying to you're trying to you're trying to fuck with this sound you're trying to mess with this flow you're trying to get this new producer right you're trying to do everything you can you're trying to go on podcasts you're trying to get viral online you're trying to throw out a hot comment but this isn't even that this is just mostly it's gone completely cold for him right um, it's crickets out there in general because of obviously the nonsense he got involved in. Was it last year? It feels like a last year or was it the year before that when, you know, those DMs got leaked. Somebody hacked into his phone or no, hacked into his Instagram account, leaked obviously some embarrassing DMs he had with Drake where Drake was kind of giving him, Drake is good at that, right? He's, cut, he's good at dropping in, seeing your story and just giving you a spud and just, you know, encouraging you kind of thing. And it's nice because Drake's obviously, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest rapper out there. So it's good when he kind of gives you that kind of encouragement because it's a good little validation of like, oh, Drake sees me. But it's not really an opportunity to kind of talk to him or to try and run a tune by him. It's just more so about, I see you, we're peers out here. It's not all, if that's how I would interpret it, if I was Dutch Valley, I'd be like, hey, we're peers. I see you, safe, man. But then when it got leaked, it showed like mad, you know, texts from Dutch's side and no replies from Drake. So that was quite funny um, in that regard. But then unfortunately, it turned really bleak, really dark, really quickly. Um, I think the first one was about him dating you know, or hooking up with some girl that looked like she was you know, a teenager. Uh, no, she looked like she was younger than a teenager uh, at the time. Oh, no, he, he was a young teenager. She looked like a teenager. She looked really young. But then obviously she got proven to be older. Just I forgot what her name was. And then it just got from bad to worse. And then some communication got leaked about him having a... It looked like a flirty conversation with somebody that was his family friend or cousin or something. I don't know. But it just came across a little bit noncy. And people obviously rightfully got annoyed about it. He went online, tried to bad boy his way out of it, tried to bully boy his way out of it. Didn't work. Ran away to Dubai somewhere. And then everyone has seen basically turned their back on him, even though he was at the next coming. The next guy coming up, it seemed like people were very quick to kind of turn against him, which maybe says a lot more about his personality. Maybe people just don't like him, innit? Because if you're someone well liked, usually people make excuses for you, right? We saw happening with the Karen Civil stuff, right? Um, she essentially, from what we've heard, allegedly, you know, scammed an entire charity in Haiti, you know, took money and from Jonah Lucas and didn't deliver on her promises. But people kind of turned to be a blind eye to it because they seemed to like her. So I think with Dutch maybe it's an example that he wasn't, you know, well liked. People kind of thought he's a bit of a prick. And maybe they saw the opportunity to kind of kick him while he's down. And unfortunately for him, he's in the UK. We just don't take that nonsy stuff. We don't take that nonsy stuff lightly here. I think I've said it before and someone said something differently. But I honestly do think if you're in the States and you get caught doing them kind of things, if you're like, you know what I mean? Imagine if Dutch got into a situation with like Daniel Cohn, right? This is a weird kind of analogy. I think he'd be fine in the States, right? But I think in the UK, you just it just doesn't run. People just don't accept they don't, don't accept it, don't have it. You, that stain is going to be on you forever. There's no way you can kind of get it off of himself. And again, like I said, 
he just didn't deal with it properly. He tried to bully boys way out of it, tried to bad man's way out of it, tried to threaten, kind of like, you know, what's that thing called? Passive aggressive, threatening kind of thing. He's way out of it and it just didn't work. It made him look more, you know, worse than it was. And um, then the collateral damage was obviously his family, isn't it? Now his sister, every time she gets her picture uploaded or a video of her looking cute or doing some dance thing, people write on the fling, uh, something about Dutchavelli, Nonsavelli and shit. The mum who was well known online a little bit, I guess, for being, you know, Dutchavelli's mum and what's her name? Stefan Don's mum. And I guess looking attractive, she now gets some stuff too. The sister, and the other sister who doesn't rap or sing or anything she gets it too so the collateral damage has been pretty severe for the entire valley dutch whatever the whatever their names are yeah <laughs> family and now in an effort to kind of rekindle his career he's now started up a weird beef with bouncer who did the um who did the fight the mma fight with arms which was quite sick actually to watch to be honest i quite like that was quite um, a refreshing take on the whole like influencer boxing matches instead of it being a boxing match it was obviously an MMA fight so that would make it a little bit more intriguing to watch um, but now he's obviously um, challenging Bouncer to fight in order to kind of you know maybe rewrite the wrongs shut up but I think they've got some beef because I think Bouncer came over and said something quite critical about him during the whole non skate shit but this is Dutchavelli basically updating his fans on what is this says of caption here getting into a ring with Bouncer following Bouncer's challenge to a boxing match so he's now replying and saying what the deal is yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see what it says. Uh, you already know, man. It's your boy Dutch. Uh, but listen, I beg my supporters, stop messaging, man, about fighting fat boy car. <laughs> he said what he said for the internet. You get me? We got back to him, told him, yo, XYZ, we're ready. You get me? He's not on it. So I beg you, I'm a rapper, guys. You get me? My supporters, man, got the bangers coming for you, lot. You get me? If my was on fighting, I'll be in the ring just more that. Love. Are you all... Yeah, I guess, in it? And then, what's the response to the next slide here? Then Your got... Bob Dutch has got an issue with me. Bounce are talking. So, yes, go in the ring and solve our issues, innit? Let's just sort it out. Come, let's fight. Um, the ball's in you, looks cool, innit? Your Bob Dutch has got an issue with me. So, yes, go in the ring and solve our issues in it let's just sort it out come let's fight um the balls in you looks cool in it so let's see the boy needs you look cool but and then what's the other update i think there's a next one they updated on something what's this one about yeah, that he's clarifying the statement, I think, because people, what does it say here? The bouncer uh, speaks. He says, again, to clear up any comments about his proposed fire with Dutch Valley and suggests that people should not be promoting knife crime and should be instead be supporting a boxing match. So trying to pivot, you know, trying to put it out there that if people in this scene, UK scene specifically, have problems, that have beef, fans should be pushing them to kind of squash it and kind of deal with it in the boxing ring maybe raise raise some money rise raise some money for charity in the process and just you know set a good example you know whoever wins and loses you shake hands and you walk your separate ways i kind of you know how it was back in the day when things weren't as um peaky as they are nowadays but that's not going to happen of course you know no one's really paying attention to what these guys actually say they're kind of the privileged few who kind of get to kind of fuck around and larp as these guys that they're larping as nowadays but it is what it is so this bounce are clearing it up let's see what yesterday videos of people were carrying knives and swords and trying to kill each other and were saying put the knives down put the knives down me and dutch have a big issue online we don't like each other you can see it i can see it he can see it regardless of anything we do not like each other we've agreed to box each other in the ring and we trying to put out a positive message that ain't this what we need to show the youths like, I, I'm confused because people will be like, it's all easy said, don't be fighting him. Or he, people will be like, don't be fighting Bouncer. But you're not from the streets. So when serious street stuff start happening, you're not, no one's not saying nothing. You're not saying nothing on the streets. So we're trying to put out a serious message. Please, guys, just get behind it, man. Serious. I've never seen someone beg to get into a ring and fight somebody so much as this. And this is so bizarre. There's always the option of just not fighting somebody, right? There's not everything, not every disagreement needs to end in a scrap. There are people that you've kind of come across in your life who you don't like or don't like you. You don't have to get into some sort of even verbal 
disagreement in order for you to kind of make sure that you don't like each other you just know what the vibe is and it? it's like when you go start a new job you just figure out straight away on your first day okay that guy ain't gonna like me she's gonna look on like me just you know maybe it might change later on down the line when you meet them or when you have a little bit more personal time or maybe when you go to like a staff party but usually you can tell who's not going to like you and vice versa right they can tell who they're not gonna like if they're not gonna like you when you walk through the door but to suggest that they all need to end in some sort of boxing match is pretty obscene but again goes to show how i say desperate but like it there is a small hint of desperation when you're a kind of public figure in the way that these guys are and you just want to garner attention especially in Dachevelli's case right no one's going to be listening to his music the way they were before the heat is not really there anymore I'm assuming people in the industry who are basically it's kind of his fr friends that basically walked away I'm sure he's probably found out a lot of his supposed to be industry friends are not his friends anymore because they obviously went to get you know far away from him as they possibly could because of the you know Nazi allegations that are hovering above his head the bouncer guy is from what I know is a guy who kind of had some troubles legal troubles went to prison came out and this kind of turned himself into this motivational kind of um you know, what does he look like? Timberland looking guy who's now like a promoter and manager and sort of shit. I think he was going through some issues with Captain Cullen. I think he's their manager. I don't really know too much about the guy. Don't get me wrong, but he doesn't make music, right? He doesn't make music. He's not a creative guy in that respect, but he's just, you know, a, a guy that people kind of go to to hear his opinions on industry stuff and road stuff, whatever it may be. But of course, he likes the attention too. So it's nice to see people commenting, asking you questions. Does really come in and say, yeah, my supporters in there. You know what I mean? Like he likes all that, right? You like all that nonsense. So fair. Yeah, I understand, but it's just boring. Like, who wants to, like, full... We have Bellator, we have the USC, we have all these other promotions out there, we have boxing. Who really wants to see two guys who should be in the studio, who should be, you know, whatever, helping their, their clients get more bloody brand deals, be in a ring boxing? Who? What does that help? What does that aid? It does nothing. It really does absolutely nothing. No one needs it. No one wants it for the most part. And it's just tired. And as the girls like to say, it's tired from both of them. For Dutch Valley's side, I get it because he needs to kind of do whatever he can to distract people from not remembering what he got up to before, what he's been accused of. For Bouncer, it's just a good opportunity to kind of come off the back of the victory he had in the MMA fight and, you know, kind of destroy somebody else the whole promo behind it will be good to get his followers up all that stuff but it's just i don't know man just get over yourself guys you know i mean like growing up you're making millions of dollars in flipping or millions of pounds are in the uk in music that beforehand years gone by that wasn't really the case people struggled to kind of make the stuff that they're making and obviously still be successful in the mainstream way and they're doing it they're well known they get followers they get likes they go places to get invited to places to get sent free shit you get to live a life where you just essentially get paid to exist like and you want to get into a boxing ring for what like you know what i mean spend your time just collecting your coins and getting more brand deals brother you know what i mean that's what i say anyway but maybe i'm wrong next year we got um <laughs> weird news confirmation here that finally the zodiac killer has been um identified but unfortunately he had passed away two years no four years prior i think or maybe more than that and um, this is curtis your skype for news a zodiac killer who terrorized san francisco identified by a team of 40 cold case investigators the reason why i'm interested in this is because i recently watched the zodiac killer movie recently the one that came out in like 2002 with like um jake gyllenhaal pretty decent movie um again you know if you're into serial killers and you've been in a serial killer subreddit you would know that there's a lot of law around zodiac killer a lot of people in the subreddit had had kind of surmised that he might have died a few years ago and now it's kind of been rung true but it's also more terrifying about this is that a lot of his friends that he lived with at the time knew he was a zodiac killer but didn't say nothing right didn't follow him into the police didn't say nothing whatsoever which is pretty wild i wonder if they're gonna get brought up in charges or well themselves but bloody hell let's see what the article says a team of cold case investigators believe that they have identified a zodiac killer who's been in the center of the america's most um, most notorious unsolved crime cases for more than half a century the case breakers who say that they are the team of more than 40 former law enforcement investigators journalists and military intelligence officers have named the serial murderer as gary francis post the air force veteran from the sierra from the sierra foothills died in 2018 according to the investigators the zodiac killer murdered five people in bay california between 1968 and 1960 pretty brutally too i wouldn't recommend watching the documentaries but the way he killed these women was just mad um obviously he had that flipping i think potato sack he put over his head he had that weird symbol um he kind of looked like he kind of looked like a superhero in a weird way right? like a, or like a villain in a, in a superhero movie like pretty scary shit 
He taunted police, made threats through letters sent to the newspapers before abruptly ceasing communication. His letters would contain ciphers, which he claimed would be revealed his identity if they were decoded. In one letter, the Zodiac himself claimed to have murdered 37 victims, and he has been linked to several other cold cases, but only five Bay Area murders and two attempted murders have been officially attributed to him. Which again shows you how... I wouldn't say useless police are, but how difficult it is, or it was back then, to actually pin somebody on some of these cases with the lack of technology and whatever it may be. Like, that's why probably we don't have the prevalence of serial killers that they did in the past, just because, you know, there's too much CCTV, there's too much technology around, it's too easy to slip up and get caught, so there's too much risk involved. But back then, you could legitimately get away with murdering bare people in one state, go to the next state, the files aren't shared between two police departments, and so just keep going over, go, go, just keep rinsing and repeating, and then just stop and live a kind of somewhat carefree life after the fact. Imagine 37 deaths that he says he has, victims he has, which is probably, I wouldn't assume, a lie because serial killers, for the most part, like the attention. They like to be, you know, they like the notoriety of it. So if he says he's got 37, he probably has 37, but they've only attributed five to him. It's like scary shit, man. So many families there, like with zero closure, what happened to their children or what happened to their um, family members or whatever it may be. It says here, despite the circumstantial evidence presented by the case breakers, federal and police investigators tasked with solving the 52-year-old mystery, Top Francisco Chronicle, that the latest development doesn't hold up. The investigator's theory is partly based on post similarity to the photos and 69 sketch of Zodiac Killer. One of the key similarities is said to be the scar on his forehead. Um, Jen Bolchers, a former Army counterintelligence agent who's a member of the team, also said letters sent by the Zodiac Killer reveal posts to be the killer than the an anagrams in them are deciphered. She told Fox News, um, so you've got to know Gary's full name in order to decipher his anagrams. I just don't think there's any other way around. There's no, there's no other way around anybody could figure this out. The case breakers also claimed that the proof that their suspect killed Cherry, Bo Cherry Joe Boats, a, a woman, um, murdered in Riversdale, California, 1966. The murder had been attributed to Zodiac in the past by Riverside Police had debunked the theory. A number of theories have also been put forward as identity of Zodiac killer of the years, including a son who claimed it was his dead father, and another man who claimed the friend confessed to the crime before his death in 20, 2002. However, the only man ever named the suspect was Arthur Lee Allen Vallejo of California, who died in 1992. Imagine him having to live with everybody thinking he was a Zodiac killer. I wonder if that brought about his early death. Mad. In response to the case breakers theory, which names Gary Post, the San Francisco police and FBI said in a statement in the San Francisco Chronicle on Wednesday, the Zodiac killer still remains open. We have no new information to share at this moment. San Francisco Police Department echoed the statement. The San Francisco Chronicle and police get hundreds of tips every day or every year, so in potential Zodiac suspects and solutions of the coded message. Now, there's some stuff on Twitter that I'm not going to show, but it does show that there's mad Facebook posts of some guy who's known this dude, um, Gary Post, before he died. And he's posting um, Facebook updates, uploads from 2018 of him, right? Um, saying Zodiac underneath his picture and stuff and mucking around, whatever, and they're just falling. But it does look a lot like him, right? For, especially from the, the Etcher sketch. And people are now saying, people are now saying that guy has gone through his Facebook and started deleting their pictures and he's closing his account. But people are screenshotting the page and stuff. It's pretty wild shit to see, to be honest. But again um we don't get that often too much people sh are more worried about their data being leaked to certain you know their data being breached or hackers getting a hold of their data by hacking into some sort of sites now people are not too worried it seems like about serial killers and whatnot and again you have to be more sophisticated like what happened unfortunately to sarah Everard, she got abducted and eventually murdered by a policeman who was kind of posing as a covid um officer right kind of took her because she was out 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 and about after curfew and whatnot and she obviously acquiesced and agreed to go with him in the car because he's a police he's a police officer right um but she probably wouldn't have done it if it was just some strange dude so you kind of have to be more sophisticated that way in order to kind of do those sort of crimes you can't just go around just jacking women off the street it's just not as easy as people think it is to do those kind of things now, especially with cctv don't get me wrong you can do it but you probably get caught really quickly as happened with the girl right is it sabrina nisa right she got um murdered in plain uh, weren't plain view but like in public outside somewhere not in somewhere secluded and the murderer was found very quickly after the fact and i'd imagine a lot of it has to do with the fact that they got cctv footage and stuff linking people to certain sort of areas so yeah man so the killer got nabbed so the killer got nabbed um this is another one this is courtesy of oh sorry about that Let's move on here. It says, this is courtesy of resident advisor. It says, Charlie Bones is fundraising for a new radio station. And I'm wondering why he's asking for money to basically set up a SoundCloud account or to 
have access to some streaming platforms, some streaming software, the stuff that I kind of use for my stuff, like OBS and whatnot. It just doesn't make any sense. It probably goes to speak to maybe this is kind of an expression of like creative procrastination, right? Where you try and raise money in an effort to kind of put yourself off from actually doing the actual work. Or it's just a weird entitlement where you think people owe you um, funds so you to go chase your dreams. It's like, I don't really understand it. It's just a, such a bizarre way to go about things. But anyway, let's continue. Um, the letter says, Charlie Burns is fundraising for a new radio station. And again, I don't know this guy. I think I, he was going viral for a bit on a, on social the other, a couple of few months ago because he abruptly quitted his show that he was doing on NTS, which is like an online radio station here in the UK, which is quite popular, I'm assuming, around the world. And he quit it abruptly out of nowhere. No one really knows what happened. I'm sure people on the ground floor probably do. The rumours and stuff are spreading, but I don't know none of these people, so I don't know what the actual reason why he quit the show was. And it was very popular. Show. People seem to like it. He quit it out of the blue. And now he's kind of coming out here with his hands, you know, open wide, asking people to, for funds to set up what it feels like a radio station, which is far more easier to set up nowadays than it was in the past, right? It's like, it's one thing thinking boiler room is a big deal when you first, you know, maybe when it first launched five, 10 years ago, right? But nowadays, if you've got a smartphone or you've got a flipping, you know, a GoPro, you can basically have be your own boiler room and stream your own sets on your own channel on YouTube and stuff pretty easily. Of course, the boiler room platform is amazing. You want to get the chance to be able to broadcast to so many people and they've got what a million plus subscribers on their account. Cool. But you don't need to ask for funds for people to set up a YouTube account, right? You just need to buy a camera, maybe some equipment to stream it with and you're ready to go. Most people that do music have the equipment already. So it just feels a bit weird. You'd be asking for money to set up an online radio station. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But we continue. The former NTS radio host who quit his East London radio station in August has shared a message via his website asking fans to please support any way you can. Donations, merge or subs, then many ideas will unfold. If you've got your own website and you're able to code that, upload all your content on there, why can't you figure out a way to stream music that you're going to do or stream a radio show? Like right now the funds are needed to invest in all studio equipment other startup costs and will run off the subs i'm going to be a complete it's going to be a complete family affair supported directly by you the listener i don't know man i'm all for just doing maybe it's just me i don't like asking for favors or asking for things off people in general i like to kind of earn my way through it it's a harder it's a longer it's a tougher journey and maybe it's a little bit um what's that word called there is some sort of uh Maybe I kind of enjoy the punishment of it. I enjoy how grueling it is, the pain that you have to suffer through. But I do think the fruits of it are far sweeter when you get to the end because you've kind of had to dig in deep and get it in the mud, right? Get it from the mud, for, for lack of a better term. Obviously, you still need help along the way. But initially, starting off, you'd be better off just doing your thing, proving the proving the concept maybe putting out some shows um yeah maybe doing that as you know doing kickstarter maybe putting out a, a whole season first and saying hey here's what i'm trying to do if you want to support the second season i need funding in order to kind of keep it going so i can maybe quit my job and do it cool but just asking people straight away to kind of you know dig into their pockets and help you set up a soundcloud and an obs account it just seems a bit bizarre it says here you can support by donating, buy merch, and subscribing to the merch membership. Read the full message here. So re visit the tribute piece of Bones, a decade long breakfast show here. Da, 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 da. I don't get it, man. Again, maybe it's just a creative thing too. Like I said, I think it's another form of procrastination where you say, if I just had this equipment, if I just had that thing, if I just knew this person, if I just go to that place, um, like all these things are, are things that people think are holding them back. And I think this is what explains why some of the bigger people are where they're at in it they just figure it out and kind of get it done and just keep 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 you know make sure they're consistent in what they're doing um obviously keep showing up and whatnot and they're okay but when you're hanging around waiting for people to what donate and shit to in order for you to do stuff it's like what you've not even proved the concept you know what i mean you have not proved it to be a viable thing you're not even shown that you can do it on your own now maybe he doesn't have any equipment and he basically went to nts to go and help them out and they provide him with the space and the tools for him to do this thing cool but then the question has to be asked well, then why do you quit nts then if they were able to do their thing for you right it's a again i don't listen to the show i don't listen to the station at all um but i know it's very popular i know people love it i know it's got a great community around it people stand around that little square in dalston and drink flipping red stripes and you know do balloons and shit and and compare you know wallabies i know people like this sort of stuff but why would you leave then if you kind of fit in there really well it doesn't really make any sense but again these people man like the entitlement is like it's just a bit gross isn't it i don't know how just maybe it's just me i just don't understand it i think if it would be different if it was like hey 
my, my studio burned down so I need to replace all the equipment okay fair enough but like honestly an online radio station to set up now nowadays it's far easier than it was maybe when NTS even first started I'd imagine so it still cre- requires some up some kind of startup cost but it's not much that you couldn't just work a couple of months a few months six months to save up to get that going and then the good thing about working while you're doing again this comes back to the argument that i've had with a couple of people in my friendship group who are kind of striving to do their own creative thing right and i don't know what you guys fall on this i'd love to hear your kind of recommendations or your answers in the comments where do you fall in the idea where do you fall in the approach to kind of pursuing your dreams i'm more of the side of things of self-funding my stuff so working a job in order to self-fund the things i want to do like the things i'm doing now the djing obviously on the side the things i obviously want to do all the time and not have to work on nine to five so i want to self-fund it by working and taking whatever money that i have from that and investing it into the thing that i'm doing whether it's buying a mic buying a camera going to book studio time to go do some mixing stuff buying headphones buying tunes all that sort of stuff right decks mixes da, 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 da. but then there's other people who say they would much rather work for a period of time save up money quit and then use that money to basically fund their dreams so if they're living on the poverty line they're eating baked beans and toast every single day so be it but they don't want to have a job whilst they're trying to produce whilst they're trying to pursue their dreams whereas i'm thinking and i'm always been on the idea that i prefer to both burn the candle at both ends i want to come back home from work at six get changed prepare my my tracks on record box go out to my set before it starts before 10 play somewhere come sleep do the thing same thing the next day and keep it going and then hopefully along the way i'll, I'll get to a point where oh wow i'm making more much more on a weekend than i'm making in a month at work so i can quit the work and continue on but i'm not going to just wait around and hoping something's going to come and land in my lap do you know what i mean but which i think some of these people do with this sort of like funding crowdsourcing fundraising sort of stuff it just seems a bit bizarre it seems a little bit especially now this stage of his journey maybe fundraise later on down the line again like you said you got a, like i said before you got the proof of concept you've shown that it's a viable it's a viable thing that people want um there's a need for it out there cool but to fundraise right at the beginning when you've not done a single thing, it just seems a bit entitled. But again, let me know in the studio. studio. Let me know in the comments what you think. What approach do you take? Have a job and use that money to pursue your, your, your kind of passions or have a job for a bit, save money, quit, and then pursue your passions just off that money. And whatever happens, happens after in the future. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'd love to know your thoughts on that one, if you may. Um, what else do we have here? We have this point you see of oh, Resident Advisor 2, the beautiful Bali uh, Potato Head Studio. Oh, Potato Head is opening a new studio and record store um, called Headstream, it looks like. Um, this is in Bali, and I'm really I'm, I'm really pissed off that we didn't go to Bali when it was there. I think probably went to 2017, I think, or something like that, 2018. And I don't think that was open at the time. I don't think I was aware of it. Um, this Potato Head is like a club and a hotel and a restaurant, I think, all mixed into one. They make amazing food and smoothies. I only know it because one of the dudes that founded it or works there used to work at LNCC. And I remember kind of seeing him on social media, basically saying he's going to move over to Bali and kind of pursue something different, which is interesting to see at the time because at that time, LNCC was kind of popping up this new kind of concept store amazing place people you know selling great designers and a bit avant-garde in their approach and stuff to so see someone kind of completely change his approach and kind of pursue a more I, I, what would you say hospitality side of things especially within the dance music electronic scene seemed a bit different seemed a bit weird and then obviously seeing potato head itself and how it's you know interior designed and whatnot it just looks fantastic so i was always kind of keeping an eye out of it it says the following the space is made from repurposed materials such as recycled plastic and motor oil bottles. You can't hate on that. Potato Head has added another creative space um, to its Bali location. In addition to its beach club, the audio file gallery and library studio is Estotica and amphitheater and hotel room. The venue also is now home to a studio. It's fucking you know, such a dream in it. It's like the Aaron Bondor of Rec Center. I'd love to have a space like this, man. All encompassing, right? Studio, amphitheater, um, venue, record store. Maybe a little salon, but a little nail bar there somewhere, you know, water bar, whatever it may be called. Located between, so located beneath the 90 meter bamboo archway, Headstream will host events and live streams, in addition with selling new Indonesian vinyl releases and zines. Amazing. It also includes a communal work zone. Live streams are set to happen at daily from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. local time with occasional streams with other Indonesian cities like Bundang, like Band. 
Bandung and Jakarta. Jakarta, Jakarta. My God, launching its coming weekend has streams grand opening would be um, Dia Baka, Gabba Moda, Soprandi, and Kita, among others. Rooted in sustainable design, the space is made out of 564 kilograms of recycled plastic and motor oil bottles um, that have been repurposed into panels, interior surfaces, and displays and windows were created using mineral caps, mineral water caps collected from the waterways across Bali while the flooring comes from industrial rubber rejects. That is such an amazing, again, stuff they don't need to do right stuff that's obviously going to cost them way more money to do to kit it out this way but you just you gotta love this approach in it to design you gotta love this approach to sustainability that they're actually putting their money where their mouth is and again whether it breaks even or makes any money isn't really their concern they want to make something beautiful and something harmonious that kind of fits in with the um the local surroundings and oh it just looks gorgeous i'm not gonna lie it looks fucking gorgeous um in addition to Bali, Jakarta-based hospitality group Potato Head also operates locations in Hong Kong and Singapore. Check out the Im imagery below. It just looks so great, doesn't it? Look at those stores. Look at that counter. Like, it's just, just the dream place to be. Bits of vinyl books and zines to go. Like, it's just legitimately the dream place to be. Like, that's one of the locations I'd love to kind of live at, you know, Bali in the future. Do you know what I mean? Just kind of um, remote work from there do or set up whatever you know creative thing that i've got from there anyway because you don't need to you know be in a set location to work nowadays especially with the advent of working from home or working remotely you don't need to be in one location you can be location independent as they say in the startup world that would be an incredible place to be man but potato head is fucking amazing i know dj harvey plays there quite often they've got all these cool looking people playing there great place like, just look how amazing that looks come on man with the mics and shit look at that look how great that looks um headstream streaming live potato head bali bringing the best indonesian talents around the world look at that oh is that what they made the the the, the thingy with the tabletop wow all the things being repurposed they're now cutting the I love too how they're using all these local Indonesian um, tradesmen as well to fully kit the place out, right? Like, so, so, so cool to see, man. Big up everybody associated with that space. It looks absolutely amazing. I really can't wait to visit once I do end up going back to Bali. Um, it looks absolutely fantastic, man. It legitimately, it legitimately looks like it's been carved into the the its surroundings, right? It doesn't look like it sticks out of the, like, out there like a soft farm. Um, it blends in with its environment really, really well. Again, loads of uh, propping up of local talents and whatnot. It just looks absolutely fantastic, man. So, yeah, big up um, Potato Head. Headstream opening very, very soon. Or is it open already? When does it say it's going to open in the article? Do, 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 do. It say it's going to open. With the information, events and schedules. Headstream streaming. Okay, it should be open now already, it seems like. But, yeah, check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Next, what else do we have here? Um, we're not going to talk about that. Let's move on from that one. Oh, it's, this is a mad one, isn't it? But look at this update. This is courtesy of Rolling Stone. Not sure if you've been keeping an eye on this sort of shit, right? But hear this out. Juicy Smollett. Remember that name? Juicy Smollett, disorderly conduct case scheduled for trial next month. Remember Juicy Smollett a few years ago? Got involved in that crazy situation when everyone was having... That was like peak... Um, what they call it? Uh, Trump derangement Trump derangement syndrome, right? Um, where people were just kind of really losing their heads over the fact that Donald Trump was the president of the United States because he was like the most, you know, unpresidential guy in the history of the world, and he was just, you know, basically riling people up and touching everyone's buttons to the point where he basically got kicked off all social media because people hated him so much. But whatever reason. The political climate in the US was, you know, tense as fuck and people were not talking to family members because of who they voted for and whatnot. And just it seemed like it was a mad place. And so somewhere within that kind of madness, just Smollett thought it was a good idea to capitalize on all that kind of tension and anger and resentment and flipping, you know, venom that exists out there by concocting this story 
that somehow he was filming in Chicago somewhere, which is, if I'm not mistaken, at the time it was really cold. It was like minus something degrees. You know, you have to wear a flipping a snood over your face and real winter coat and trousers and snow boots to get through that harsh bits of weather. And he was filming, or he was staying in a hotel that's in a very posh kind of part of the neighborhood where you won't just be walking around, you know, just loitering with your friends. It's only going to be a place where you go to kind of, you know, visit somebody or go back to your apartment. But he basically kind of started a story. So I get too excited. He cut to the story that he basically got assaulted by a couple of um, white nationalists who were wearing Trump hats in the middle of winter, um, just as he was coming back from Subways to get his, to get a sandwich to eat before he went to bed. And for whatever reason, they beat him up and they put a noose around his neck. And then he wore that noose all the way back up to his hotel room until the police came, kept it on him until the police saw him. Um, and then the, you know, for the moment that story came out, no one believed it. And then it, it became even more fun. It became even more hilarious when it was uncovered that the people that he said assaulted him were these two massive, you know, built like a brick shit house Nigerian dude who are, you know, darker than I am now in this light that I'm in now at the moment. Complete opposite of what you'd think a white nationalist was. Just Smollett for whatever reason maintained his innocence. You know why anyway? Because it was a lie. That was basically used in order to kind of uh, an alleged lie. Then again, don't sue me. Um, again, used as an opportunity to kind of probably his career, which I don't think make any sense either because he was in a really good place. It felt like he was doing power. He was kind of well liked in the industry. Um, his sister's obviously a really good actress as well in her own right. So it just it, it's just seemed weird. I don't know if that side is true. That's a bit I'm interested in. I know he lied, but I want to know why he did it because it doesn't make sense that somebody as at the time he was well liked he was singing and shit he was on a breakfast club like he, he he was building up some steam he was like the next kind of guy coming up i didn't really understand why he needed to do that but again maybe you know on his side of things he saw things a bit differently but regardless now it looks like i don't know if it's tied with the actual lying of the case or something else but whatever it may be he's gonna have his day in court and maybe we might find out some more details anyway this is courtesy of rolling stone said just similar disorderly conduct case scheduled for trial next month so after all those years two years now i think so far we're now finally going to get some resolution it's a justice Smollett. Um, who faces felony disorder conduct charges over the prosecute over the prosecutor's alleged while staging an attack in 2019 while in Chicago is headed to trial as Chicago's WTTW reports. On Tuesday, Cook County Judge James Lynn um, said the jury selection for the case will begin November 29th. Smollett has pleaded not guilty. The charges stem from a 2019 where the former Empire star had an apartment. Um, had who had an apartment in Chicago filed a police report after he allegedly suffered a racist and homophobic attack near his Chicago dwelling, which sparked a hate crime investigation. Following the detailed investigation, authorities claimed Smollett staged the attack. Alleging the attack, <laughs> the actors who paid two acquaintances, brother Ola Binjo and Adimi, um, Abinbola or Sondario, to help him scheme. Smollett was indicted and pleaded not guilty. In an abrupt turn, prosecutors dropped all charges against the actor in March 2019, with the actor agreeing to forfeit his 10,000 bail for the city. And I think that had to do with the fact that whoever was the mayor knew his family. So this was a, a rare case of black privilege. He comes from a very well-to-do family. They're very well connected. And whoever was the acting governor or a mayor, or whatever it may be, was associated to their family and she did a favor to him. It was just a really interesting case to kind of look at from the outside. This That August, a judge appointed special prosecutor, this of, I think Dan K. Webb, to the case for an investigation. Webb indicted Somalia on six counts, charging the actor with making four separate false requests to the police department. Officers related to the false claims that he was a victim of a hate crime. Due to the pandemic, Smollett's case has not been set for trial until now, though Smollett and his lawyers, along with the prosecutors, have been arguing in recent months over Smollett's defense attorney, Nene Uche. Prosecutors allege that there is a conflict of interest between Uche, had interviewed the Osundario brothers shortly after the 2019 incident, and they may be witnesses of prosecutions. However, Lynn has ruled that Uche can remain on Smollett's legal team. So we're finally going to get a conclusion to the the Tory Lane shoot Megan Thee Stallion thing very soon I think hopefully and we're also going to get a conclusion to the Justice Smollett staged the attack or did it actually happen and he just didn't know those guys were actors and they weren't actually white supremacists I don't really know while jury selection is on the docket for November 29th there'll be a hearing or the motion to dismiss in the case October 15th a lawyer Smollett did not immediately respond to Rose over comment separately the city of Chicago is suing Smollett to recoup the cost incurred police investigation so he's getting sued he's got four charges against him in court more like it or not if he's smart or if, he's, if his advisors are smart they're going to try and get him just to kind of accept a plea deal but i guess at this point if he's maintaining that he's innocent and he didn't do what they said he did and he thinks the attack did happen he probably should go to court just to clear his name 
legally speaking, in the same way that OJ cleared his name, legally speaking, right? But we still think he did it. <laughs> I think just some should just still go and do it anyway, because what's going to happen to him? What's the worst happened to him? He's well connected. He's got money, it looks like. Um, he's been basically on the back burner, on the sidelines, not be able to act, perform or do what he needs to do, go to award shows for two years now. He's been out of the limelight. And I'm sure for somebody who's a celebrity or an actor or an entertainer, it's probably been a very distressing time right because they probably questioned his you know reason for being right when you finally find your vocation you finally find something that you know you're passionate about career-wise and then you can't do it for the best part of three and a half years maybe more it must be mad you know what i mean he might have some crazy thoughts going through his head so most likely he's probably going to go through all of the case and just be like you know i need to clear my name f this i'm not having these people kind of count me out in this way but what a wild wild situation to be in i think they've got the same article here on the new york times said the same thing it's interesting that whenever he goes to court he kind of you know brings along his family members and holds some woman's hand at the front i wonder if they all believe he's innocent too or do they just support him because of his family because i guess if you're just your family you just have to support the guy it is what it is but i wonder if they actually believe the guy do you actually believe that he's innocent or do they think he's guilty and they just you know even if he's guilty, they're still going to be there for him because that's what family do. But God damn it, man. He's put his whole family through the ringer. I don't even think his sister can do that many interviews now because of, I mean, that's what it does. It affects you because now his sister can't enjoy her, you know, her kind of relative new um, fame that she's getting. People are recognizing how good of an actor she is. She can't kind of bask in that glory because people are going to immediately ask her about her brother. It's just, it's just a very shitty situation for everybody involved. But yeah, jury selection starts soon maybe we'll have a conclusion on this whole diabolic affair that happened with Joseph Smollett um but you know stranger things have happened in life stranger things have happened then we continue here we got this courtesy of Glock Topics one of my favorite accounts to follow on the old Twitter space and it says the following this is courtesy of Doja Cat and again I'm conflicted with this because I'm a I like Doja Cat I love her appeal. I think she's got X Factor. I think she's actually D1 when it comes to the female rappers kind of acts at the moment. I think the, all the attention that Megan Thee Stallion gets, she should get. She's far more talented, far more versatile, um, has far more range, and is far more interesting as a personality in general. Um, but, you know, she's got her baggage, got her thing. She went through that whole, like, you know, was it... Um, why she premises chat room shit? You know, she's got her thing. So it's what it is. She's a bit quirky, a bit weird, but I like her in general. But I don't like this sort of stuff. And this is because your block topics. And it says Doja Cat speaks out after being overworked in a series of deleted tweets. The reason why I don't like it, because I've been following Doja Cat from afar for like the last 10 years or so. And there's mad clips of her online sounding completely different than how she sounds now. Um, moving different, you know, saying different things. But she's been slowly but surely evolving and refining who she is as an artist for that long. Right. It's been a real slog. And she's finally in the last few years come into her own and become a global megastar right it's been incredible to watch especially off the back of all the attempted cancellations for her to ride that storm and just become who she is now it's sick to see she legitimately has those videos you know travis scott that video where he's performing um he's performing at some sort of um event it's just him on stage raging and there's only like 10 people in this crowd or something right and then it fast forwards later on it's like you know he's a big star he's now the moment arena tours and doja cat has a similar sort of bits of footage of her performing in a car park somewhere to a couple of fans who know some stuff from soundcloud and then she you see her now and she's this polished star who can dance looks amazing right has great stage productions and stuff cool but from the onset if you know anything about doja you know you know she always wanted to be like this person that she is now a star right a mainstream global pop star in that regard and you've achieved it but who gave you the impression that achieving such a thing would be easy or it'd be like a walk in the park or it wouldn't require you to be overworked or it wouldn't require you to have unfair expectations put upon you because if you're a global star and you have the x factor people are going to want to attach whatever they can onto you because they know they can make money right people are going to have their mortgages and their plifting child's education dependent on their success of being able to execute plans for you. So there's going to be a lot of pressures coming at you from all different points. And I understand it's going to be stressful, but if you want to be a pop star, this is basically the game you have to play. This is what's required of you. This is the entry requirements to be a pop star. If you want to be the next one, you want to, you know, be the, I don't know, the whatever, the Nicki Minaj now, the these young era, whatever that she, people are paying her out to be. This is what you have to do. So to hear her complaining in these kind of deleted tweets just feels a little bit, it's a bit like, it's pointless, do you know what I mean? Because 
you could always just shift back and just be what you were prior five ten years ago and then that's okay right but then you don't want that you want more and then when you want more people require more of you it's like i always think about it in work and i always say to my friends when it comes to like jobs i've never really been the biggest fan of like having jobs in the first place because i've always been super ambitious about stuff i wanted to do but over the years i've been kind of mellowed out my stance and i've kind of realized that jobs are really fundamental they are they are really important in terms of allowing you to pursue your dreams without money and without you know yeah without money basically you can't do those things right i'm not going to go and ask my parents for money and stuff because my dreams are none of their business right they don't have any they're, they're not invested as much as i am in it so to expect your parents to be funding you or your friends is just ridiculous and diabolical you can't be going out to get loans either because that's dumb so the first thing you do is that you go get a job to you know to kind of fund your dreams but i was always really critical to my friends i think i've done it mistake a couple of times myself maybe a couple of jobs ago i kind of did the same mistake where maybe you take a job that requires a lot of you you're not willing to put a lot in it and then you get annoyed or you get upset when they want to move a different direction or they demand more of you. I've always been a big believer if you get a job that kind of requires you to kind of maybe stay a couple of times late at work, maybe to attend some meetings that you don't want to attend, start early, just requires you to turn things around really quickly. If they're willing to give you that money to do that job and you're willing to accept their terms, you shouldn't then turn around and complain later because it's quite clear what they want from you especially when you come in entry level you come mid-level and you get a promotion later down the line if you're happy just doing the assistant job and just not being the shot caller and not having to do budgets and having to do kind of you know um lay out plans and specs and whatnot then yeah just do your thing what you're doing now but then as soon as you get the promotion you have to also expect that the workload will also increase and i think for whatever reason singers and entertainers seem to think that it's not the same they seem to think whatever they were doing prior that was okay that was fun they're now going to continue because that's what i'd imagine i'd imagine the, the more successful you get the less fun it starts to be which is why a lot of people say the careers of like the frank oceans and stuff are the perfect ones to have because he gets to do what he wants on his own on accord right he gets to take a step away to step away from the industry when he's feeling a little bit overwhelmed get back in again when he wants to do the stuff and he finds understandable of understanding of it but if frank ocean went to be the weekend he'd have to kind of make a conscious effort and be okay with being pushed and promoted the way the weekend was when he was you know doing his thing and even he's doing it in a very clever way also but anyway let's go into those tweets themselves doja cat says the following needs to delete your tweets i'll read it from the screen um ba -ba -ba -ba. it says the following i'm just tired i don't want to do anything i'm not happy i'm done saying yes and motherfuckers can't uh i'm done saying yes uh, was i'm done saying yes to motherfuckers because i can't even have a week just to chill i'm not even working i'm fucking tired alex is getting old he's 68 years old and i can't even be there for him um i want to be alone i don't know who alex is to her it continues says it's not anyone's fault but mine anyway i just keep agreeing to this shit i don't want to do it it's my own dumb ass fault and then i'm too tired to put any effort into this shit because i'm not so run down for everything i think some people have noticed it. there's some there's been some performances of her where she clearly looks like she's kind of going through the motions because she's been singing the same song over and over again but you know she's quite quick and quite weird people probably didn't think too much of it but it's basically put some meat to the bones of that story um and then somebody asked her why don't you just um just don't do the next concert she says i have to of course you're contestually agreed to do that and then she says like i don't care anymore man so she's clearly frustrated clearly annoyed at the pressures that have been kind of put up put against her but i don't know man this industry is kind of mean and kind of manipulative and kind of exploitive Ex yeah, yeah, it kind of exploits um some of its bigger stars but if anything it's quite consistent in its exploitation you know exactly what happens to you when you enter that machine you know exactly what happens to you when you want to start going on those shows you start wanting to go on those tours you want to start going in you know at those your award shows you want to start rubbing elbows and shows with certain people it's going to take you to a next level but it's also going to demand a lot more of you and it's probably going to take a lot more from you too um so that's just the name of the game so i don't really not really sure how much i like i like or enjoy artists that complain about this sort of stuff i always think it's a little bit it's like they want everything they want the anonymity of frank ocean they want the success of a taylor swift they want the family life of beyonce like it's just you can't have everything there's going to be a stage in your career where you're going to have to forego a lot of things just to kind of get where you need to get to then you're going to need to progress and then move into other things it's just what it is and i guess for women it's more frustrating because you don't have um an eternity to do to do those things right um your body clock is running down there's only a certain time that you're able to raise a family if you do want to raise a family maybe being as successful as they are too it limits the amount of people that you can date because you know you're top one percent or one percent you're not going to settle for anything that goes by and guys might be intimidated by you so there's loads of things that happen in there but unfortunately this is the kind of um 
this is a sort of a what what do they call it this is a sort of a, oh, what's that word called it's something anyway this is this is a sort of deal that you make with the devil in some way shape or form right um you want success you want to sell records you want to be on the billboard you want to go coachella you want to sit on that chair with ellen this is the name of the game and that you're gonna have to get overworked you're gonna to do some things you don't want to do but that's just part of the part of life really i don't really have much more to say about it when it comes to that to be completely honest and then i think that might be it you know to be honest i might actually leave it from there and then jump onto the short thing later yeah let's just leave it from there for the time being that's been the Agassino Zing Show episode number 504 it's been 101 hour 20 anyway so I don't want to waste too much more of your time thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time tuning to the show via YouTube you know what to do smash the like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening to the podcast that please leave me a 5 star review and share the show with your friends and I'll see you guys again very very soon peace